one of our uh, professors from St. Mary's University, uh, Dr. Greenaway. He works with the philosophy department. Uh, we were going to get into the topic of how politics and law, does it benefit or does it not from having God in the picture? We'd have to know what we mean by politics or law. And we would certainly have to know what we mean by God. If one means by God, you know, some sort of Zeus type character, you know, a deity on the clouds. There are a lot of people who, I suppose, call themselves Christians or who reject Christianity because they think that that's basically what God amounts to. Somebody on the clouds looking down and whatever. But the deeper meaning of God is probably, is probably the name that God reveals or gives um, in scripture. Yahweh, I am who am. It's, it's, the notion of pure being. But God's a, a handy name to use. But as Tom Aquinas tells us, there's a better name, and it's quite simply being. So to come back to the question, do you need being for politics and law? I would say, yeah, yeah, you do. Does one mean by that, by God, a particular religious tradition? Maybe to have particular kinds of politics and law, you do. Mm. Because beneath every politics and law, there is what we might understand as a philosophical anthropology. There's an understanding of what human beings are. If you want to have a politics that really works, it's got to be able to fit our understanding of what a human person is and to extrapolate out what human communities are. What you were saying of belonging, uh, they, they want to have uh, some sort of structure, right, where the people are, are the essence of what the government is doing, right? Because it identifies them, it represents them. The fact that we are beings and that there's an association of God being, right? Just being, then it states that we ourselves take part in that being because right. we are being, right? And our name for that is existence. Like it sounds very mystical, but it's actually very concrete. We can't even, it's really hard to even say it in language, but we cannot be like we exist we have a share in being we, we have to work out what our lives are for but they seem to be about something i mean look at you look at you like you're doing something here you found it worthwhile there's some things that you've come to know you've paid attention to many of your experiences you've come to understand certain things about life in general and your life in particular by being intelligent and attentive You've made some really good judgments about the truth of things. And now you've made a decision to follow certain worthwhile paths. A kind of argument popped up or a different argument that I've heard uh, with existential philosophers saying that we create our own meaning. Yeah, what would you say to that? It's partly true, I would say. It might be better to say we discover meaning. Again, it comes down to this philosophical anthropology that I was talking about. If your notion of being is that it's a great big empty space with a couple of planets in it held together by a couple of forces, but basically it's just empty, then in principle, we're like atoms just floating in a vacuum. Yes, exactly. We're just, everything's by chance and atoms. Yeah. Are but we, but we, we exist in a cosmos. We begin from a pattern of of relationalities. The cosmos basically is you and it's me and it's the natural world and it's the ultimate conditions, the, like the mystery that there's such a world at all. That's all part of it. And it's how I relate to myself. We're always in relation. We're not lonely, solitary atoms. It's nihilistic and it's not going to end well for anybody. I mean, what do you say to your children? You are no more than a solitary little atom floating in a cup, floating in an empty space. Your life comes to nothing. It means nothing. Right. And the depression can set in and what was the point of life? Right. And, okay. and does and what it be saying, like, we're all just atoms. That's all we are just by chance. And everything's by chance is to almost say that we're like robots without any emotions or any free will or any kind of logical, rational way of going about life. And yet, as 
Jose was saying earlier, I mean, we, we do try to create structures. We're able to verify our truth claims. And so things work. I jump on an airplane. If I'm sitting on an airplane and I'm like 30,000 feet up in the sky, flying along at like 600 miles per hour, I don't want to be some sort of relativist who says, well, there's no such thing as truth. I want to know that this thing's going to get me from here to there. I want to know that things work. I want to know that there is such a thing as, as truth. The lonely relativist who's caught up in their own world has a hard time affirming that there is suffering. It's no consolation in the long run to say, well, I'm a moral relativist. Who, where does that leave you? That kills your conscience. That drives you to despair like you're just saying. I'm a moral agent, and the world needs me to be authentic, to be real, to care about truth, and to enact goodness, effectively to love. I need to love the truth, I need to love goodness, and I need to love myself as an agent of both. We get to share the experience of humanity, and we know what pain feels like, and so we can, to a certain degree, put ourselves in their shoes and be compassionate about what they might be going through, a human being, they're not just particles. They're not just like, oh, it existed and then it went away. It was a living human being that was, you know, to, to, due to the circumstances, uh, killed, right. Or, or suffered death. People talk to me about atheism. I find that they're actually very nice people, (laughs) like super nice people, nicer people than I am. And do more for other people than I do. And yet they'll sort of throw in, I am an atheist. And really, I don't think they are. Because even within the Christian tradition, the great commandment is to love and to love what? God and neighbor. It's like love moves in sort of two directions at once. That if you're loving your neighbor, you don't know if you're loving God. It's what Carl Ranner called an anonymous Christian. To me, real atheism is that sort of self-violence which results in a killing off of one's conscience. And there could be so many different reasons for that. But it results in the nihilistic activity of, of brutality and destruction. But the killing of one's own conscience is a refusal to think. Mm. And it's a refusal to properly value what needs to be valued. Because there is suffering and there's potential suffering. And I have a role to play in either the furthering of suffering or in the removal or the alleviation of, or the prevention of suffering. I am a moral agent. To promote conscience is to be, to be, right? To be a being and to promote beings. You know, you need being to have politics. You need to have people uh, creating meaning to yeah. have politics because if you kill the conscience, if you kill the being, then what is there to build? There's nothing to build. There's no reason to build. There's why, yeah. why build an organization? Why have yeah. politics? Why? And, and when you do well, I'm doing well too. So why don't we talk? Why don't we work together? Why don't we build each other up? Why don't we live the common good? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's concrete, but it's also something, always an ideal to be, to strive after. Without conscience, you don't care about your neighbor, care about your community. So then um, it kind of falls apart, the structures that we need. And mm-hmm. that ties into politics, it ties into government, it ties into, a, I would even say, maybe a healthy society, for lack of a better word. You know, because without conscience, then you don't care about the well-being of others. And then, yeah. you know, like what you were saying with politics, you have nothing to strive towards. When one stays stuck in one's just ideal of reality, it can sometimes be draw some people to to make egoistic decisions that are based off of themselves, right? Oh, it's just what I believe, my religion, my my stuff, you know. And so sometimes it cuts away from uh, solutions that can maybe arise from from fruitful conversations. Closing yourself to off to every other thing that doesn't agree with you could certainly lead to ignorance, and actually might bring you further away from the truth if you really want to seek the ultimate truth the order of things in truth is the order of things in being so being being god of course but yeah from aquinas's perspective anyway if it's truth that you're committed to what why why would why would you be afraid why would anybody be afraid of it 
the allegory of the cave. How could one not talk about Plato's allegory of the no, cave? No, no. Okay, so all the prisoners at the bottom of the cave, they've been there since they were babies. They're not even able to look around. They're all chained up. They're facing images on their screens, all they can look at, the, the side of the, the cave. And one of them is released and dragged up and out of the cave. And on the way out, there's a fire. He sort of sees the source of the light that's in the cave. And he can also see all the little sort of models that are being put in front of the fire. And their shadows are being cast on, on the wall, this, what I called the screen earlier, that they've been looking at all their life. And it's pointed out to them that this is, this, is sort of, this is a higher reality than what you were looking at. And he's like, no, 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 it's not. No, it's not. Right? The guy can't handle the truth. But eventually, you know, it's so overwhelming, he, he has to humble himself to it. Yeah. But he's dragged further up and out. And it's, it's physically difficult. It's spiritually difficult. And there's more light metaphorically representing the truth. So eventually he's out and he accommodates himself to life outside the cave. And he feels the heat of the sun. Instead of shadows of models, he sees actual animals or whatever and trees. And he's delighted. And then he remembers his fellow prisoners, his people, back down in the cave. And he's, he's sorry for them. He wants them. He wants them to experience this. Here's a guy who loves the truth, but who realizes that it's not just for him. If you've got something that is so precious and so beautiful to share, and you know some people that you think are worth sharing it with, you're basically obliged to go to where they're at. If you want, I will unchain you. I will give you freedom to like, don't touch the chains. Don't touch the chains. As Plato said, if if he goes and uh, if any of them can get their hands on him, they thrash him to pieces because he knows exactly what happened to Socrates. And if you're Christian, you know what happened to Christ. Like.